customers, that means Judy and Jane. This is Jack Brinkley speaking, and bringing you Irving Vendig, author of your radio show, Judy and Jane. Mr. Vendig is going to tell you what has happened and what's going to happen on Judy and Jane. Mr. Vendig. Thank you, Mr. Brinkley. Well, to get to the point, our present sequence in Judy and Jane concerns the marijuana evil. You know, the marijuana cigarette, the reefer. Well, Judy, Jane, Jane's husband Donald and their friends are faced with this problem in Honeycrest, their hometown. Now I'm going to ask the sound engineer to fade me out, and I'll bring you a short scene to show you how we introduce the problem. Donald North, Jean's husband, is running for county attorney. Jerry John Boggs, a newspaper reporter and friend, suspects that marijuana cigarettes are being sold at Honeycrest High School. So together, they follow a young boy they know has been smoking marijuana and see him meet Sam Jones, high school janitor, and go down to the boiler room. Sam, I, I gotta have those cigarettes. I gotta. Oh, I have a heart, will you, Sam? Don't you understand? I haven't had one for a day. Look at my hands. Look at them shake. Oh, my stomach. <laughs> yeah, if you want reefers, you gotta pay for them. But so much. I haven't got so much. I can't afford it. That's your worry. Go mooch some money. Get it somewhere. Oh, I would have, but you didn't say you were raising the price. I didn't know it myself. I... Just got word from the boss. Things are getting hot around Honeycrest. There's Donald North. Look here, Toby. Do you want these reefers or don't you? Well, you know I gotta have them. Well, then fork over the money. Three dollars now. Right. Well, Sam, I, I'll have to go without lunch all week. It, it's tough going without lunch. Ah, sob your heart out somewhere else. Okay, here's the money. Here's your envelope. What's that? The door. Hey. Stick up your hand, Sammy boy. I'll take that envelope, Toby. Wait. I'll take that envelope. Yeah, and we'll take Sam. Where? Hey, who's going to take me? We are. To the police station, baby. Well, I won't go. Oh, yes, won't... yes. Yeah, you'll go, Sammy boy. You'll go along with Donald North and with me just like the little lamb that you are. Huh. You ought to be glad that's all we're doing to a rat like you, just taking you to the police station. Yeah. You ought to be glad we don't work you over first. Come on, Sam. You won't need a hat. That's the way our major plot was introduced. Now, of course, a dope ring isn't broken up easily. Donald found that out when he tried to get Jones to testify. Jane, Donald's wife, went to Sam's wife, persuaded her that by turning against his boss, Sam could save himself. And Sam agreed if the North first arrested the boss he feared so greatly. And now let's hear what Nick Rodin, Sam's boss, has to say on this. These Norths must have thought they were playing with children. Did they think I'd sit by and let them convict me? <laughs> me, Nicrodan? <laughs> well, they've got another thing coming now. I slipped Sam out of that Honeycrest jail as easy as you please. And I took him for a one-way ride, if you know what I mean. Now we've hit the first major obstacle in our story. The search for a witness who can prove the North's right. But public sentiment turns against them. Here, let's try another radio trick. Let's look into the mind of our heroine, Jane North, and see what she thinks. The murder of Sam Jones put us right back where we started. Now more than ever, we have to solve the case. But where could we find another witness? By a mere freak of chance, I learned of a girl named Gloria Harris, who might have bought cigarettes from Rodan. Hurrying to her house, I found her prostrate on the floor, doped. With Judy's help, I picked her up and rushed with her to my home. We nursed her back to consciousness. And learning that she was afraid of her parents, shielded her from them until Gloria was recovered. She was a sweet child, and I came to love her as she came to love me. And finally, when she learned that she could help us by identifying Rodan as the man who sold her marijuana, she volunteered to testify. But we had a fight on our hands. I summoned Gloria's parents and told them her story. Unbelieving and shocked when they finally had to believe that their daughter had been smoking dope, Mr. Harris wanted to disown the girl. I worked with him for hours and finally won his forgiveness for his daughter. He said he would take Gloria home. But the battle was only half over. I needed Gloria for my witness. At first, Mr. Harris refused to listen. 
but Gloria bravely threw herself into the breach, as you will hear in the following scene. Father! Gloria, you heard your father say, come home. But I want you to listen. Father, you must listen. You want me to love you. Come. No. No, I won't. Gloria, you seem to forget. Oh, please, Father, please listen to me without interrupting. Without... There's no need for further argument, Gloria. No, no, there's no need. That's just it. There's never need for further argument as far as I'm concerned. You act as though my opinions weren't worth anything. You wonder I never come to you. Gloria, you're talking to your father. Oh, see, that's the trouble, Jane. That's always the trouble. If he'd forget he was my father for a moment and treat me like a human being. What do you want to say, Gloria? I listen. You will? Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. Well, it's about Jane mostly and Donald and Judy and the rest of this family. They need my help, Father. They need me to testify for them. Oh, Father, they didn't hold back when I needed their help. Now let me do something for them in return. Let me get up on that witness stand, Father. Let me help them convict Miss Rodan. After some hesitation, Mr. Harris gave in, and Nick Rodan was arrested. Unable to learn the name of our witness, and unwilling to take any chances, Nick had Donald kidnapped. And sentiment, which had been swinging in our favor, turned against us once more. I was accused of running away because I was afraid. Fortunately, I had passed my bar examination last year. So to prove just the opposite, I decided to try the case myself. What is your name? Gloria Harris. Speak up, please. Let the judge and jury hear you. Gloria Harris. Now, Gloria, did you ever smoke marijuana cigarettes? Yes. Where did you get them? I bought them from a man. Gloria, pay strict attention now. Yes. Is that man in this courtroom? Yes. Remember, you're under oath, Gloria. I know. Stand up, Gloria. Now, will you point out the man who sold you marijuana cigarettes? Yes. There he is over there, at that table. He's the one they call Nick Rodan. With Nick's conviction on the dope charge almost a certainty, a new factor entered the case. A Honeycrest policeman on leave in Chicago recognized and arrested the man who had helped Nick take Sam Jones out of the jail. Faced with possible murder charges, Nick's henchman broke and agreed to give evidence against Nick. Hearing of this development, Nick sent for me, asking that I come to his cell. Nice of you to call, Mrs. North. What did you want, Mr. Rodin? I want to, uh, trade. We've nothing to trade, Mr. Rodin. Oh, yes, we have. Your husband's life from mine. My husband? What? I've got your husband, you know. He was kidnapped on my orders. And they can't burn me any worse for two murders than they can for one. Now, that's logic, isn't it, Mrs. North? Well, I... I... Take your time. Take all the time you want. Take it over. Well, my proposition will stand. I'm not going to take it back. And uh, it's a pretty good one, don't you think? My no good life for your husband? That was the hardest decision of my life. But in the end, I did what Donald would have wanted me to do. I went on with the trial. Meanwhile, Ben and Jerry were searching furiously for Donald, but to no avail. But fortunately, before the trial ended... My husband was rescued. Yes, and I walked into that packed courtroom just as Martin Craig was summing up for the jury. <laughs> you should have seen Rodan's face. Was he surprised? He was a lot more surprised when the jury brought in a verdict of guilty. Oh, no, I wasn't. When I saw North walk in, I knew the jig was up. But I'm no coward. I've dished it out all my life. I guess I can take it, too.
there you have a sample of Judy and Jane Entertainment. I believe it gives you a good idea of the program. It's up-to-dateness, it's genuineness, it's very definite qualities of excitement and suspense. And finally, I'm sure you see in it the universal appeal that keeps Judy and Jane always in the very first group of America's favorite radio programs.